Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber, I'm Director of MTF Labs, and this is the MTF Podcast. Now, some years ago, I was a professor in a media and cultural studies department at a UK university, teaching, among other things, on a music industries degree course. And when that's your focus, you tend to cross paths with other professors in media and cultural studies departments at UK universities who teach, among other things, on music industries degree courses. It's not an enormous subset of the academic world. And so, as a result of this selective professional socialising and collaboration, I know and work with Casper Melville. Casper's a senior lecturer in global creative and cultural studies at SOAS, which we'll talk about and unpack. But what I really want to discuss with him is his recent book, It's a London Thing, How Rare Groove, Acid House and Jungle Remapped the City. So, Casper Melville, thank you so much for joining us for the MTF podcast today. So, you are, as I mentioned, a senior lecturer at SOAS. Let's start with that. What's SOAS? Well, SOAS is a part of the University of London. Its actual name, the acronym SOAS, stands for School of Oriental and African Studies. Now, we call ourselves SOAS now because we're all very uncomfortable with the term Oriental. And of course, there's a sort of inbuilt sort of discomfort with the whole thing about SOAS because SOAS, which originates in the early 20th century, was a school for training civil servants of the empire, or sometimes known as a school for spies. You know, it was the place that, that where the British government sent their civil servants to learn the local languages of the places that they were going to go out and administer in uh, Africa and in the Far East and the Near East and Malaya and Singapore, places like that. So that's the history of the institution. It has been affiliated with the University of London for I'm not quite sure how long. And now it's a kind of, now it's a university. It's part of, it's in Bloomsbury, n- right near the UCL and uh, the Institute of Education, which has actually been absorbed into UCL now. So it's kind of in the university intellectual part of of London, around Russell Square, Bloomsbury area. Right. But you're not teaching spies how to speak Mandarin. I don't think I am. No, I'm in the School of Arts. I'm a slightly square peg in a round hole in the sense that the School of Arts at SOAS, it wasn't originally an arts and humanities based institution. So the, the, the core of it, after it had been the you know training imperial civil servants was politics development those kind of questions you know war people specialists in water language is very important out of this developed an art stream so people who were particularly you know they were africanists african specialists but they had a particular interest in music there were people in the korean studies you know in what they call area studies this is you know not a discipline but you study a particular area they kind of banded together and they set up a music department And then there was a history of art department, similarly local area expertise, China, Korea, Africa, usually older forms, kind of traditions, you might call it. And this banded together in the School of Arts, which was formed maybe 10 years ago. And then I've been at SOAS for about eight years, and I came in to teach something called creative and cultural industries. So this was SOAS recognizing that while the ethnomusicology and the history of art were really important, there was a missing link, partly to do with media and cultural studies and partly to do with recognising that all of this is caught up within a set of kind of industrial systems and processes. Obviously, the internet and the sort of digitization of culture, which came in the 2010s, was happening all around. And there was a sense that they wanted to kind of recognise that. So they brought me in. It was partly under pressure, I think, to think more about careers. As you know, having been an academic, this idea of, you know, well, what am I going to do when I finish my course? What job does it lead to is quite a big component of the academic market. And they wanted to answer that question a little bit more straightforwardly by suggesting that, you know, the kind of course that I teach, which is actually called Global Creative and Cultural Industries, is for postgraduate students, many of whom are already working somewhere in the arts, maybe in arts management, in arts policy, or they are a musician or a, an artist of some kind, and they want to think about how they can kind of build a career and that, that's part of the kind of thing that I teach. And there's certain kind of skills components. So I teach a class in podcasting. I do a kind of work internship program, which allows students either to go and work for a short period of time, do a placement somewhere, or develop their own entrepreneurial project, a website, an event, record an album, and kind of think reflexively about themselves as a cultural worker. So it's that kind of element. I'm part of something now called the Centre of Creative Industries, Media and Screen Studies, which is a slightly expanded unit. I work with a professor who's a professor of film studies, but who has similarly moved from 
thinking about film only as, as an aesthetic object, she's an, an African film expert, to thinking about film as part of a global information market. How is it distributed? How does it get made? How can you make a living doing it? <laughs> can you make a living doing it? All of these kind of questions. So that's kind of where I sit rather. I mean, I quite like being uncomfortable. Having been trained in cultural studies, it's kind of built in that you're always going to be somewhat not fully within one discipline. You're going to work interdisciplinary way, which is both exciting, but can also feel somewhat, you know, unanchored. Yeah, there's always a long answer to what is it that you do? Uh, I find Was that the long or the short one? I'm not sure. Probably the long one. Well, I, yeah, it's not a one word job description like lawyer or a doctor, is it? No, or a sociologist or I mean, hence these incredibly long titles for these classes and a lot of students kind of writing and saying that sounds really interesting. Can you explain what it actually is? <laughs> yeah. you know, where, what will I be? What will be on my certificate when I come out of here? And these are all slightly difficult to answer questions, which I think indicate a big change in the university sector, but also in the job sector, which is there is no one job you're going to go and get. Exactly. You know, you know, it's not about applying for one job. It's really, as you know very well, given your, you know, the nature of your career, what do they call it? Portfolio career with precariarity somewhere in the background, but also with the freedom to follow your interests. Yeah, I think it's actually more foreground, generally speaking. <laughs> well, but, yeah. so, but the entrepreneurial aspect of this is kind of interesting because, I mean, I used to say to my students, anybody who... Uh, you know, aspires to a job in the music industry, lacks ambition. It's, it's one of those things where most people who do these sorts of courses, they go out and start things for themselves. They don't tend to end up in the mailroom sending out CDs to, to newspapers. They start projects that are important to them. They, they, like you say, they record albums, they start podcasts, they, they build websites, they make things that are very kind of self-starting. To what extent is that sustainable, do you think? Oh, well, to go alongside your advice about, you know, you're lacking in, uh, ambition if you just want to work in the music industry, I tend to fall back on telling my story. And I wanted to encourage students to realise that this is not the first time in history when it's been difficult to get a job coming out of university. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. Margaret Thatcher, what she did to Britain, there were no jobs in the early 80s when I was coming out of school. But also, similarly, we didn't aspire to have jobs. You know, there was a very strong sense that you could go and make your own culture. Obviously, I was surrounded by club culture, which was a paradigm of the idea of young people doing things for themselves, managing to make a living. Is it sustainable? Well, I think you, what I say to the students and what I actually believe is that you need to be realistic about, you know, your desire to make money doing exactly what you want and balance that with I know these days they call it a side hustle or something like that, but I waited tables for 15 years while I was a music journalist. I never made money as a music journalist or a radio DJ or even a club DJ, not, not proper money enough to pay the rent. So I waited tables. I worked as a barman. Not only do I think that's a wise thing to do is to have a job which pays you like that. I think it's a good for you. I think it's a good thing to do. And in the life that I've led in the media, you know, I've been a magazine editor. I've been on boards. I've been in the kind of upper class, middle class world in academia as well, you can really tell the difference between people who've had those kind of jobs and people who haven't. You know, the kind of things that you learn from doing a job you don't particularly like, but, you know, particularly in the service industries or, I don't know, delivery driver, whatever it is, it kind of puts you on a level par with everyone else in the world who has to work for a living, teaches you some really important things and keeps you humble. And being humble, you know, no matter how creative you are, how brilliant you think you are, the world does not owe you a living and nor does it you know, have to pay you to be an artist. You have to earn that. But the uh, the end of the lesson is, but you can end up being a respectable professor and a, and a you know. <laughs> well, I'm very lucky to have a, a full-time job, a permanent job in academia, and it is quite rare and getting rarer. You know, academia has done a good job of turning out people with lots of skills, but not providing, you know, the, the infrastructure has not provided the support, you know, the jobs for those people. And academia is increasingly reliant on kind of temporary precarious work. I mean, so as, as an institution, I think many others are trying to address that. It's, it's really moved quite high up the agenda to not to rely on temporary teachers and non-permanent staff to do a lot of the teaching load. But, you know, there are economic reasons why that's the case. So I am lucky in that way. And I should connect this to, you know, some of the great work which is being done on the creative industries at the moment by people like Dave O'Brien. There's a book that's just come out called Culture is Bad for You, which is based on some research with hundreds of workers in the cultural sector. And one of the narratives that comes out from the generally white middle-class men who run the show is, oh, I've been so lucky. <laughs> look at me, I've just been so lucky. I've never been that ambitious, but look where I am. And I have to acknowledge that that's also true of myself in that sense. It's not just luck, it's structural luck. 
that I could flag myself into. I mean, I didn't come out of academia. I got this job at SOAS having been a magazine editor and a journalist. I had done a PhD 15 years prior. Didn't have any teaching experience, didn't have any publications. So in some ways, it was a bit of a punt that I applied for the job. And there are elements of why I got it that I fit. And so as no matter its aspirations to be very, very multicultural and sort of forward looking, is still there's a high concentration of white middle class people teaching there, just like me. So I, that's something I'm aware of and I recognise. The white middle class, middle age male thing aside for a moment, do you think that academia benefits from employing, I guess, people like us in the sense of non-traditional academics, people who have been out in the world and experienced things that can be directly passed on to students? Oh, yeah, I do. I mean, I really do. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've hung on to my job. I mean, we've gone through various painful restructurings and things like that. I mean, the simple fact is the courses I teach, and it's not just down to me being a brilliant teacher, are popular among students. They want that kind of information. They want that kind of advice. They want to see people who have worked outside the academy. And I think the academy could do a much better job of, of being more flexible and allowing people who aren't lifetime academics into the institution. This would also mean those people who are lifetime academics being prepared to step out of that space and do other things. And I, there's not as much fluidity there as I think there should be or could be, because I would very much, I'm very keen to break that clear distinction between, you know, what is often called the ivory tower and the real world, what academics call the real world, <laughs> as if they're not part of it. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a huge, a huge value to the institution. However, there are built-in processes of publication, of track record, of having become institutionalized, you know, all the way from undergraduate to MA to PhD to postdoc, where you haven't had a chance to be outside in the world. And if you did that, it's a bit like, you know, the way women get punished for taking time off to have children and other things like that. It's kind of you've got a break in your CV and you have to account for it in some way. And so I can just see the way that it's not deliberate, but the, just the way the things are set up tends to replicate the system, which I think is, is not a great system. And one of the things that the system encourages is, as you say, publication. And uh, you've managed to sort of tick that box a little bit by putting out a book quite recently. Is it the kind of book that uh, universities are quite happy to have you tick that box with, or have you kind of gone off piste a little bit? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know, but REF, you know, the Research Excellence Framework, which is this six yearly kind of spasm that the universities go through where everyone has to submit work, which goes to a committee, which is then adjudicated on, and then that decides how much money flows to the university. So it's very serious. My book has just gone into that process. So I've no idea what people think of it at that level. And, you know, there's something about it. It doesn't sound like an academic book. It's a London thing. How Rare Groove, Acid House and Jungle remapped the city. I mean, I've got references in it. I did publish it as an academic book, but it's about things which might not be considered to be legitimate subjects, I suppose, by some people. Well, worse than that, you committed the same <laughs> crime that I committed with my Radio on the Digital Age book, which also went through the, the ref process last time around which was it's readable. Oh, I know. It's funny that I, when I first got into academia, I mean, I was trained as an academic to doing a PhD. And in doing a PhD, I did that typical thing where I arrived at the university and I thought, okay, I've got to read everything. And I tried to read everything. And it was the high point of post-structuralism. It was Foucault. It was Baudrillard. There was postmodernism. It was Frederick Jameson. It was uh, Spivak. And it was uh, Homi Baba. And it was some very exciting theoretical work, some of which is incredibly difficult and some of which is very poorly written. And I then churned out a PhD, which was, surprise, surprise, poorly written, incoherent in places and was actually a lot worse of a piece of work than I might have produced outside the academy. It didn't really fit either way. I had very nice examiners. I kind of scraped through, you know, I, with changes and whatnot. I then went and did something else and I became, I did online journalism and I became an editor for Open Democracy, which was this kind of online discussion forum newspaper thing, and then became a magazine editor. And that's when I learned to write properly, editing other people's work, thinking about an audience, thinking about a readership and having come back into academia. The first, one of the first things I did was write a book review of a book, which was called, oh God, I can't remember who wrote it now, but it was a book about why sociologists write so badly, basically. <laughs> and his argument, which absolutely I think I agreed with, was that 
it's not a coincidence, it's that they're trained to write badly. There's something about the process, particularly journal articles and that whole kind of what you will know as well, Andrew, is which is basically a scam where academics don't get paid to write things which they don't really want to write because they have to put all their credentials into this piece of work and spend ages getting to the point, which are then published in journals that basically very, very few people read, which cost universities a vast amount of money. A total scam. But anyway, I wrote that piece. Well, not, not only that, but uh, it's peer reviewed. So the people who have to review it, which also contributes to their CV in inverted commas, is also unpaid labour. Exactly, exactly, which is something I found out recently. And again, I'm, I mean, I think most people in the world, well, the people I've told can't believe it. You know, what you put that amount of effort, I mean, to write an academic journal article might take you three, six, eight months a year. I mean, it's that level of labor and it goes through lots of iterations as well. And it can be very painful and it can be rejected and all of that. And there's not no money in it. And for the reviewers, there's no money in it. There's prestige and reputation. Or if you're a really great academic, like my friend Les Back at Goldsmiths, who is so much my academic model, he does it out of the love of ideas, out of care, out of concern for the truth and for clarity and things like that. So there is, it's not just people bigging themselves up in that process, but there's something fundamentally broken about it, which is partly why, not partly, I wrote the book. I've only got one academic article to my name at the moment. I've got some book chapters, which are sniffed at in academia. Ref apparently don't like book chapters. I don't know why. But so I've got the one academic article. And then I thought, well, I could sit down and write three or four more articles, but maybe what I should do is write a book. And then at least it goes to ref, you know, so I've ticked the box, which says it's gone and I don't know what they're going to do with it. But actually the whole reason I got into academia, I went back to academia, you know, I, was, I did my undergraduate degree and then I went to America and I lived in America for like seven or eight years. And I was sort of not, you know, I was a DJ, I did radio, I was a magazine journalist steeped in music, which is what is my love. But I went back to university to do a, an MA with the aim that I wanted to write a book. So in a way, but it's taken me 20 years to sort of complete that cycle and to get the confidence and I think the writing skills that I felt I needed to write something that is clear and explicable and isn't indigestible so that it can be read by people who aren't academics. And even though I wanted to publish it as an academic book, not just for ref, but also because I want academia to know this stuff as well. I want to force them to reckon with the importance of popular art and popular culture as a valid thing to write about and a valid thing to have on the shelf. So I did, it was a dangerous dance potentially. And I, some people have raised their eyebrow at me or suggested, but particularly the bits, you know, I mean, in the book, I do throw in a few first person stories, slightly disguised as kind of ethnographic notes, but really they're my memories of particular music scenes that I have, sure. uh, you know, experienced as a way to try and bring it to life a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting how how much of a parallel there is. In my uh, in my radio book that I wrote, I did exactly the same thing. I did some sort of first person narrative recollection of you know listening to radio as a kid in the car with my parents and blah 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 blah. And that sort of thing outside, I guess, of of ethnography is kind of like you say sniffed at. But in a sense, what I was trying to do was write the book that I wanted to, while still ticking the ref box a little bit. And for me, I don't know about I don't want to speak for you, but for me the book ended up not being the book that I wanted to, it to be because it wasn't sort of an inverted commas journalistic enough. It was much too academic and it didn't feel authentic or representative of what I wanted to communicate. Did you have the same problem or were you just very much comfortable in, you know, with one foot in both worlds? I don't know what, where you are, were you in your career or your age at that point, but it took me, I mean, I'm 54 now, right? So I am quite old and I came back into academia quite old. So I felt less intimidated and less anxious. I just felt, and, and as I got my foot into teaching, something I knew nothing about really, and enjoyed it and kind of bedded myself in, I thought, okay, well now I've got the opportunity to do this. I've written, a, I've actually written a book that I do like, and I do think that it worked. It is what I wanted to say. And partly it's because I am not only an academic, but I'm, I like theory. Sure. I like ideas. I find them exciting. I find them my life has been formed partly by ideas that I've picked up from Stuart Hall or Paul Gilroy or even Foucault, which I think are useful tools for helping to understand the world. Yeah, sure. You know, power knowledge, 
or the nature of diaspora or the fact that identity is a journey, not a destination. And we're always trying to decide who we want to be and who we are. We present us, you know, Irving Goffman and you the way you present yourself to the world. You know, these to me are core idea, philosophical or ideas with philosophical weight that help us to peek behind the veil of the world and defamiliarize a lot of the garbage that we get thrown at as if it's real. You know, Gramsci's notion here that basically we're in a struggle for the truth with ideology or with you know hegemonic ideas we've inherited they're so deep in our bones and our minds that we need some tools to unpick them and get behind them and that's what i think those academic ideas are so i i was happy writing it as an academic work when i first talked to my publisher they were like well do you want to do a trade book or do you want to do an academic book and first of all i didn't know what a trade book was but then when i, I thought what well, is about building or something but when i figured out what he meant yeah I was very keen to do it as an academic book and I wanted to do it like that. And I didn't find it. Some of the people who've read it, I mean, one of my, the terrible reviews I got on Amazon was from someone who said, you know, this reads like a really bad university thesis that would have got a D. <laughs> and there is an element where you've got to wade through, I suppose, for some readers, there's, you know, lots of names in brackets and there is some conceptual ideas at the beginning when I frame it. But actually, well, partly what I wanted was to give people who weren't academics access to those ideas to see that they were relevant because you can write about music by just sort of saying, well, listen to this banging beat or tell the biographical stories of the people involved. And I, that's important as well. But actually, I wanted some conceptual tools, you know, like the idea of diaspora. You know, what is happening in music in one particular place in the world is linked at a deep level to what's happening in other places. And there are reasons why that linkage happens. This is where Paul Gilroy's idea about the Black Atlantic, this kind of interconnected culture, African diasporic culture where, where ideas and people and musical forms circulate. I mean, that's a key idea because that stops us from thinking just within the national frame or just in a narrow sense of, oh, well, let's look at what's happening in London because it's somehow natural that it would happen there. There's nothing natural about it. It comes through a series of political and social processes and movements. Right, well, let's talk about the content of the book to a larger sense. So we're talking about Rare Groove, Asset House and Jungle primarily and their situatedness, if you like, in London. There's a whole lot to unpack there, obviously, and you've spent a whole book doing that. But what is special about London? Is it, is it, as some people say, a different country? It certainly felt like that over the past few years. I mean, if you think about the whole narrative of Brexit and the whole idea of, you know, Britain turn, you know, wanting to get great again and sever its ties with Johnny Foreigner, and it really felt like London was different. And you could tell that in the narrative because London was often put up as this kind of elite space, which gets all the funding and West, the, the Westminster bubble or the Islington bubble or all of that kind of stuff. And there's, there was an element of truth to that. We always have, you know, we've got a left-wing mayor. We did have Boris Johnson as mayor, but generally we have more left-wing politics. We have a more, a more welcoming attitude to strangers because it's a city full of people who aren't from here, frankly, and that gives it a special character. So I do think there's something quite special about the character of London. In the book, I do trace this back to empire because London was the biggest beneficiary, and you can see that all around you, of empire, and has also been the place which has therefore and then received migration from the empire, which has brought the empire right into the Western city in a way that wasn't the case in London in the earlier periods, although different waves of immigration, Huguenots and Irish and all kind, and Italians and Maltese have always characterised what's going on in London as well. So one of the books that I quote says, you know, London is, is not about Londoners, necessarily, or you can become a Londoner. I mean, I think there's a really interesting character of London. I don't know if you've ever lived in London, Andrew, but you can become a Londoner much more easily than you become British or English. Like you, some, in some sense, you can never become English if you're not from England, but you can become a Londoner after about three or four months. And the first thing you realize is it's grim, it's cold, it's dirty, and people aren't very friendly. So that's the first set of experiences. And then you realize that actually under that grim surface, there's a common culture because we are all in that, we all have to wait for the buses together, use the same grimy tube stations and corner shops. So there's a sort of we're all in it together thing. And then under the surface, again, is this incredible, slightly hidden away, slightly, you might say elitist, but it's not quite elitist, but it's not that easy to find. But once you do find it, you know, you go down a grimy set of stairs and you open a door and then you step into sort of an amazing cultural ferment. And I'm describing club culture here, but there are all kinds of, you know, there's the Soho kind of boho seedy culture. There are interesting things going on in very uninteresting looking places in a very, very large city. 
Interesting. So let's just uh, really, really quickly, so that we know what we're talking about. What is Rare Groove? What is Acid House? What is Jungle? Okay. So, I mean, I think the way I should do it is tell it backwards. Jungle is a musical genre which emerges in London in the mid 1990s. It's electronic music. It's related to, and in some people even argue, a kind of offshoot of house music, which is this kind of digitized, funky, soulful thing which was going on in New York and in Chicago and Detroit, and then brought over to the UK. But the distinct nature of Jungle is that Jungle also is strongly influenced by reggae. So it's got this deep reggae bass lines, and then it's got these very fast break beats, which refer to tradition of hip hop and then beyond that to funk, but they're sped up digitally. So it's digital music, it's dance music, and it's got this strange relationship, sort of fusion of African-American forms like house music and, and hip hop and reggae and with some other elements to it as well. It's got a kind of scary sort of horror soundtrack type of vibe to it as well. Quite intense music. I was not in London when this emerged. I was in San Francisco and I heard this music and I thought, what the hell's going on? It's really quite shocking when you hear it. It's going so fast. It's so intense. It's so, but on the other hand, it's quite familiar. And the familiarity for me was the reggae element. And the reggae element, reggae is really important musically and re especially in London, but had been kind of pushed aside by house music and rave music at the end of the 1980s, but it re-emerged in Jungle. So it was, to me, it was kind of like, who's making this music? What's going on? And I really want to get back to London because I want to experience this. So I came, moved back in 1997, partly to try and figure out what Jungle was all about. That pushed me back to think about Acid House. Acid House was something that I had been I was in London when, that, when it took off in London in 1987, 1988. It was a profound moment of youth culture. It was a change in the music. You'll know the music, most people will. You know, this kind of very much Chicago influenced kind of digital music again, but which was very different from soul and funk and reggae and jazz. A new kind of, a new arrangement of musical elements digitally alongside, of course, other kinds of technologies like drug technologies. Obviously, ecstasy was a huge part of that. So I wanted to tease out the relationship between reggae and acid house. And then that pushed me further back in time into Rare Groove. Now, Rare Groove was something that happened, again, it happened really in, only in London, in, in the UK, only in London. In the mid-1980s was a period of time when a group of DJs, most of whom were black, but not all, DJs, an older generation than the audience, who knew a lot about music and had great record collections from which spanned from the late 1960s all the way up to the 80s, taking in soul, funk, even African-influenced music, and also ska and reggae and rock steady. And during the mid-1980s, when London was rapidly de-industrializing, just the height of Thatcherism, and there was uh, high unemployment, there were a lot of empty buildings around in London. And those empty buildings were repurposed by this group of young people who not only had the records, but they had the, the tech as well, because they had access to sound systems, i.e. massive hi-fis. They knew about sound systems because of the tradition of the reggae sound system, which had taken root in London in 1958 and then rapidly spread. There were hundreds of sound systems. It was carried largely through, you know, black London, Jamaican influence very strong, though not everyone involved was Jamaican, fathers, brothers, cousins, all collaborating to build their own sound systems. They, you know, using old wardrobes and planks and whatnot and using engineering skills. It was very hackathony, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It was absolutely hackathon. And it was it was sophisticated. And they, these sound systems could draw on. It was so interesting. I mean, many people are involved in the sound system. Some of them were trained as engineers in the army and would come and lend their skills. One of them who was behind, uh, who worked with Coxon, which was one of the great sound systems, he was an engineer at Heathrow Airport who put together like the air traffic control system. So it was a kind of community-based collaborative effort, primarily because black Londoners through the period of migration from the Caribbean, which starts in 1948, so-called Windrush generation, are excluded from clubs and pubs and football and all the other sort of places and spaces and rituals of British life and British working class life in particular, because these black migrants were mainly working class or kind of didn't have access to the middle class world anyway, either economically or because of structural racism. So the sound systems are really, the best way to think about them is that they're a kind of way of creating space because, or, and building your own mobile nightclubs. And 
what you then need when you've got a sound system, you've got the records, is somewhere to do them. Now, the sound systems in Jamaica, in Kingston, they're outdoors often because they've got the weather. Well, London doesn't have that weather. So where are you going to do them? You'll do them in all of this empty factories, old cinemas, old mush, you know, old kind of storehouses, old bus garages. This was the period in the mid-1980s in London where rare groove was the dominant musical form. And rare groove really isn't a genre. It's just a way of saying black music from the recent past, from the last 20 odd years that you've probably are not familiar. And deep cuts, particularly. Deep cuts, that's the rare bit. Yeah. Because this music often was not released in the UK, didn't make the charts in the UK, had to come in via other routes, secondhand record stores, and then put them into these buildings, the so-called warehouse parties. So what it seemed to me in putting all of this story together, because I had some familiarity with Rare Groove. I really was born, my, my life started, my education happened. DJs like uh, Norman Jay and Jazzy B from Soul to Soul, who were older than me and had the tunes, educated a whole generation of Londoners, black Londoners and white Londoners, at a point when, although racialized space and you know the riots that happened in London in 1981, Brixton riots, and again in 1985, there was sus going on, all of these kinds of over forms of over-policing, which were infuriating the black community who were not being treated, weren't given their, their rights. At the same time, this multiculture was emerging because we'd all been to school together. You know, I went to a comprehensive school, 2,000 kids, basically about half white and half black, a few Asian uh, kids. And we kind of had to get along or not get along. And there was a lot of fighting and there was a lot of kind of tension. But for those of us who wanted to seek something different or who were animated, I mean, as you know, speaking as a white person, I was animated by a strong commitment to anti-racism. You know, it was pick a side time in London, and I wasn't going to pick the side of the racist skinheads at my school, obviously. And I was going to ally with my black friends, and music provided a, a way to do that. And then the warehouse came along and said, This can be your space because, you know, you couldn't get into clubs in Soho very easily. Groups of boys couldn't get in, groups of black boys definitely couldn't get in. It was always tricky negotiating the, the forms of regulation of those spaces. Suddenly, none of that mattered. The bouncer was your own age. If you could find the place, and London was full of this empty space, it's not like that anymore. I mean, those, if you go and visit London now, if you're at the Tate Modern and you just walk a bit east, you will pass Shakespeare's Globe, you know, this historic theatre. Neither of those were there. There was no lighting. They were just empty dock spaces. Nobody even knew where they were, you know, even though it's not that far from places you're familiar with. It was this kind of empty space. You know, this is where Foucault's idea of the heterotopia, you know, the kind of a space which isn't really a space. It's kind of, it's not really on a map. Nobody knows who runs it. And because of that, it afforded this generation, the rare groove or warehouse party generation, a chance to really build their own culture. And that was such a clear influence on rave that I felt that was part of the story as well. And one of the reasons I included Acid House in the story is because I feel very ambivalent about Acid House. I went to raves. I loved raving up to a point, but I had criticisms about it, point one, and we can get onto those. Musically, you know, aesthetically, anything that's completely based on drug taking is bound to end up in a bad trip. But also the priority that rave was given in the story of club culture is if raves were the first time people got together in unlicensed space to listen to loud music. And that clearly wasn't the case. Rave didn't create club culture. It gave it a huge boost. And one of the obvious things it did was got, it got white men onto the dance floor where hitherto they had been very reluctant to go. But that is not true of black men or black women. And you know, it was a moment, but it was a moment that I felt really needed to be connected and contextualised alongside these other musical scenes. Is there any discourse about, uh, well, that wasn't a London thing, that was a Manchester thing, the, the Acid House? I oh, know there's a massive discourse about that. And I sort of allude to it in the book. There's a funny debate which goes on between rave, you know, amongst ravers, where between the, the Manchester, the Northerners, let's say, and the Mardi Northerners and the Cockneys, they call us the Cockneys. And there's this dispute about, well, who did it first, right? I do tell and retell the story, which I call a myth, although it's true, of these four London, white London geezer DJs, these working class boys who had gone out to Ibiza, who went to Amnesia. DJ Alfredo hipped them to having a wider musical mix than they were used to and blending together kind of pop music and Balearic alongside uh, Chicago house music and taking ecstasy all at the same time, like in this warm weather. And then they came back to London and they started, they each started a club and it was very influential. That's all true. 
simultaneously is happening in Manchester. It's got different components. It's much more related to a switch amongst white youth taste from indie to dance music, which was happening at the Hacienda, was happening under the influence of ecstasy. Very, very significant, but that those books have been written. You know, Dave Haslam writes about that and many others. So I'm not trying to give London priority. What I do want to say is that there's a context for understanding it in London. It wasn't the first time, like I said, dancing to loud music was happening in the city. House music was coming into London in all kinds of routes before the, the acid house moment that I've just described, often played by black sound systems, where the music was put in the larger context of hip hop, electro, and other forms of electronic sort of black avant-garde music, where, which wasn't defined by taking ecstasy and was part of the overall sort of way in which these genres develop and change and shift. And many people are happy with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with this. It's a, it's a good idea to allow popular music to make, to change, particularly one of the reasons it needs to change is to evade capture by the market. Although it's obviously within the market as well, and we shouldn't romanticize it as being something, you know, pristine and outside capitalism, but there is a tendency to, for the music industry and the market to grab a hold of key genres and kind of suck the life out of them. But that's okay because the club genre has already shifted somewhere else. We've talked a fair bit about DJs and dancers and venues and, and spaces and not a lot about the artists, the recording artists. Were there key recording artists in these genres? Oh, God, yeah. I think it's different with each of them, which is fascinating to me. So taking Rare Groove, Rare Groove is, I mean, if we think, you'll, you'll be familiar with the, the idea of rockism in you know, pop music writing and, and the music industry in general, which imagines that the key issue is the band and the band who have a career, who possibly geniuses like the Beatles, they exist over time, they do live shows, they produce albums, they have, you know, that, that's the kind of model. That model can be applied to Rare Groove up to a point. So you've got figures like James Brown within Rare Groove, who's absolutely pivotal, He's a key songwriter, he's a key producer, he's a key band leader, he's a key sort of rhythmic genius who instills this, these ideas into his band who then go off, they go and work in lots of other genres. One generation of his band leaves because they're, not, they're pissed off and not getting well paid, so he brings in Bootsy and Catfish and reinvents the JBs. You know, so there's a story there, Stevie Wonder, you know, a whole series of great artists. But the other thing about Rare Groove is what matters to Rare Groove is the danceability of the track not specifically the band or the album. These units matter much less because in the end, it's the DJ playing something off a vet record to an audience. You don't know who the band is. And a lot of the Rare Groove canon is music that was underrated or f forgotten or generically was too, uh, didn't fit easily within the, the way in which American uh, music industry is sort of divided up racially you know, between soul and folk music, for example, or if you mess with those generic boundaries, you might fail. And then that music was rediscovered in a new context. And I would say that if you went to a Rare Groove party, 80% of what you hear, you wouldn't know who it was by. And when you did find out, you'd be like, oh, that's the African Music Machine. That's the Mighty Riders. It's like you've, there's just these, just hundreds and hundreds of bands who are great that no one's ever heard of until they start being recovered first by DJs and then by the labels who are employing DJs to put together compilations. And that, that whole world of kind of the reissue and the looking back and the, you know, awesome takes from Africa and that whole world emerges out of that kind of curatorial aspect of Rare Groove. So in that sense, of course, the producers, the rec I mean, when you buy the record, you can pour over who's playing the bass, who's playing the drums, who produced the record. Key figures like Charles Stepney emerge or um, Gamble and Huff or, you know, some of these key. You start getting a picture of the incredible depth and creativity of the black American recording industry of that period, some of which was successful, some of which was completely forgotten and not loved in America. So when it came to Acid House, a completely different set of questions emerged. The first thing is, this was not music that sounded anything like music of the past. There was no band. There wasn't that setup of, you know, drum, bass, keys, guitar, vocalist that you would expect. You couldn't hear any of that. It was clearly music made with machines, possibly music made by machines. There was awareness at some level that the music was made by someone, but that someone wasn't a musician primarily, they were a quote unquote producer. It was someone who had put the stuff together themselves. I mean, we became aware of this because we knew about hip hop and we knew that within hip hop, 
the actual sound tech was made by someone playing around with digital technologies, with drum machines, samplers, and bits of other people's music. But that wasn't what was going on here because in hip hop, you can recognize the reference points of the previous music. But here you couldn't because the sounds were actually what were foregrounded was the sound of the machine itself. So the most famous element of the acid house sound, of course, is the wobbly 303, the Roland 303, which is a little bass emulator, was being used in a way not to sound like, as it can, sound like a bass line being played, but to sound like a machine. This strange wobbly sound, which DJ Pierre, who came up with this, says is an accident. You know, he was just playing around, not knowing how to use this bit of kit, which he had got secondhand, didn't have the manual, didn't have any training, and just found the sound which he thought sounded cool, sounded futuristic. And that squelchy, weird sound, which underpinned that particular moment of Acid House, laid over thumping digital beats, you know, which don't sound like a drummer and they're not meant to, they sound like machines pulsing. So this threw into disarray any kind of idea of a band or a musician. And beyond that, even if you, when you're in the Acid House moment in the club, you can't tell the difference between one track and the next. They're mixed together by DJs who are deliberately blending these things together. So you actually are not aware of even a track. The whole thing becomes some kind of large ongoing soundscape. Plus you're very disoriented by dry ice, often strobe lights, and whatever you've taken to go along with your acid house experience. And for the very large proportion of the crowd, that was ecstasy, which deranges you in lots of other ways. So there was, it completely broke that sort of fandom connection, that kind of, oh, I love this tune connection. You know, I've always, you know, that kind of familiarity thing, which drives pop clubs and often discos and things like that. And then if, even if you drilled into it a little bit, like maybe you sidled up to the DJ and had a look over their shoulder to have a look at the label. Chances are you'd either find a white label there which is an unreleased piece of music with some th something scribbled on it, or even if it was a commercial label, what would it say? Bam Bam, the Night Writers. Just a bunch of new words which didn't seem to relate directly to any particular person or anyone. You know, you didn't have a sense of the person behind the music. And it's only with investigation that I've done that I've kind of been able to figure out there are actually real people behind this. You know, there's Frankie Knuckles and there's the um, the Belleville Three making the techno and that there are real people, but they very deliberately hid themselves. They were not involved in the global record industry in terms of marketing. You didn't see their pictures on record sleeves. There wasn't a great sense of who these people are. It took the media a long time to catch up with what Acid House really was. And it was always treated as what mattered was what was happening on the dance floor or in the rave, not so much the person who produced the music. This is what allowed the DJ to partly intervene there and become the key mediator. And the biggest, the first most famous stars of acid house and house music were the DJs. And initially in, in England, it was actually the British DJs who became famous, the Danny Ramplings and the, the Paul Oakenfolds. And it was only latterly that, you know, the audience kind of caught up with the fact that they were basing what they were doing on the model of people like Frankie Luck Knuckles, Larry Levan at the Paradise Garage or Tony Humphreys or... You know, this generation have latterly become well-known and famous, Jeff Mills and all the rest of those brilliant characters. I guess the the other part of this would be that it's quite hard to portray this kind of music making on something like Top of the Pops. Oh, well, absolutely right. I mean, and Acid did start appearing on Top of the Pops in various guises. The first influence of Acid House was this kind of the way it started to sort of influence pop music. You've got bands like S-Express, Mars, who kind of used slightly acidy type sounds, which were around in the ether, but plugged them into a slightly more conventional idea of a band. I mean, Essex Express weren't really a band, but they pretended to be a band for the purposes of Top of the Pops. Or sometimes you'd get like a singer, like a Kim Mazel or one of these kind of great Chicago vocalists would appear with a couple of dancers. But it wasn't really clear who was the person who'd actually made the music. And that kind of anonymity fed, I think, was a productive thing in one sense because it broke this kind of commercial relationship which has been established between the audience and the band and the catalogue and the album and allowed the scene itself a lot of space to develop. Like lots of these producers, you know, put out loads of music under different names and didn't feel that they had a problem experimenting. They weren't sure this stuff was going to sell. It wasn't really about that. It was about, is it going to make the dance floor move? I guess um, 
808 State would have been an outlier in this because they were very much a band, weren't they? Personally, I don't know if they were a band in the sense that were they people who played musical instruments and then added an electronic element to it or were they producers? I don't know that, although they did appear on Top of the Pops. Um, I know a guy called Gerald was involved with them as well in the early days. And of course, they had some big hits. The key, what happened in Manchester, which is different from London, is, as, as I think I referred to before, is that the Acid House thing fused with the indie rock thing. So then you've got bands like The Shaman and these other kind of bands who've been kind of stalwarts of indie guitar rock who then were kind of converted to Acid House, of course, Happy Mondays, and the whole Madchester so-called baggy scene, you know, which refers to their sort of baggy clothing and the kind of baggy attitude that they had. And that was the moment where you got a fusing of these two different, the sort of indie rock tradition with the Acid House tradition. That didn't happen in London because we didn't have an indie rock tradition in London. I mean, even pale skinny white boys like myself liked black music in London. And I didn't know anyone, any white people or black people who, who liked, you know, rock music or, I mean, it, to such an extent that I first heard Led Zeppelin when I was in my mid twenties in America and the people playing it to me could not believe that I didn't know it <laughs> inside out in the way that they knew it because they were so into this idea of British music being exemplified by that kind of thing. But we were in a completely different bubble. Then to, just to follow the point up to Jungle, obviously the producer in terms of the person who's actually behind the production of the music becomes absolutely critical in Jungle as it was in Acid House. It's that, that's actually the moment which changes the relationship from band, who is then a producer, comes in to try and create a record in collaboration with the band to the producer being the person who originates everything about the music. And oftentimes in Jungle, that person is a DJ already right so you've got shy effects or you've got jumping jack frost or you've got fabio and groove rider these guys started off as djs and then become producers and start and, and set up labels and start knocking out music there are some producers who were not originally djs someone like andy c or you know some of these guys who had come from the kind of peripheral suburbs of of london been drawn into the black music world via rave then tried their hand at producing and then came in that way then you get new new figures that you can kind of that the scene are based around and within jungle the key presence who hasn't been there before is the mc like the vocalist the chatter and that is a practice which is derived from reggae sound system culture which is very strong within the sound system although not all sound systems have chatters some of them don't but the ones that did like saxon where a kind of british reggae vocal style was developed in the early 1980s but when house came along that disappeared from the club scene. And in fact, Rare Groove didn't have that either. Rare Groove didn't use MCs because it was so much about the records, the musicians and the records from that period. So early raves, if you had someone come on the mic in an early rave, they'd pretty much just be saying like, get on one, let's get radio rental, that sort of thing. But that during in 92, 93, with the emergence of hardcore, which is a kind of acid house splits into multiple subgenres. That period is usually called hardcore or hardcore without the H. That's what Simon Reynolds calls it. Hardcore, you know the score. A lot of this is coming through pirate radio. And again, the main human, the main figure in pirate radio is this person who's on the microphone talking. And how are they talking? They've got a weird, not a weird, a very beautiful experimental combination of Jamaican patois, Cockney slang, comments about football and fashion and hip hop references all mashed together in this new kind of code switching style like the sociologists call it code switching don't they because black londoners traditionally have been able to speak in a number of different ways already because they can speak in proper english like their parents often spoke as they were trained to speak like that in jamaica in the british schools in jamaica but they can also speak in an extremely sort of yardy patois they can do cockney if they've grown up in the east end you know if you listen to someone like dennis bevel the great dub producer i mean he can do every kind of accent under the sun plausibly anyway so within the jungle scene, you've got the re-emergence, because of reggae sound systems, of this British vocalist, this vocal style, who was there to orchestrate the dance, to relate, to interact between the DJ, the producer who's made the music, the DJ who's playing it, the dancing crowd, in this kind of call and response type of activity. And those figures like MC Dare and Skibidi and Shabba and the Ragga Twins, most of whom got their initial music training and sound system culture emerged strongly in the jungle scene. And it's what upset a lot of ravers about jungle because they did not want their 
high, disturbed by the re-emergence of this strong black voice, which was sort of pulling the whole thing back to, more towards carnival, more towards a Jamaican aesthetic, which at the same time as black crowds started coming back into rave spaces and they who pretty much, you know, rave was kind of mixed at the end of the 80s, but then just it kind of became whiter, you know, I mean, just empirically in terms of who was going to raves. A complex issue about why that happened in the book, I kind of talk about a number of different factors, one of which is that contrary to what a lot of people seem to believe, the taking of kind of uh, synthetic drug, class A drugs, as we call them in the UK, is not that common in black club culture. Smoking weed, yeah, but not that kind of heavy chemical thing. And as rave developed into hardcore, it did get incredibly druggy. I mean, to the point where people were well out of control. There was people lying on the dance floor. There were teenagers crouched inside the base bins. I saw this at a club in, called in the Labyrinth in Dalston. Quite upsetting in some ways. You know, these young kids who are really, really out of it, taking some combination of amphetamines, LSD, ecstasy, being cut with all kinds of rat poison and other things. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is the music itself became harder, more industrial, more like industrial forms of rock music influenced by Belgium and Holland and other parts of Northern Europe and move further away from a kind of black diaspora aesthetic musically. And I think just as important is there were so many other musical options at that period of time, you know, early nineties, this is the high point of hip hop. This is the emergence of new soul. This is, there's acid jazz is kicking off. There's all kinds of, there's great soul clubs. There's great dance hall. So there were lots of other options for black clubbers, not so much for white clubbers because really they didn't have access to a lot of those black underground scenes, but they did to the rave. So the rave basically went overground and became this mainstream, slightly predictable, rhythmically lacking in diversity. And, you know, you, the same kind of beat all night, you know, throughout the whole night with some peaks and troughs for people to come up and down on. And Jungle just messed with that whole thing. Rhythmically blew that apart, chucked away the 4-4 basic format by having break beats and these deep bass lines and, um, and brought back this carder of DJs. I mean, I focus on one particular group in London. It's, they weren't the only group, but what I call the Brixton Acid Mob, who were these guys who'd all grown up together. Fabio Groove Rider, Dave Angel, Colin Dale, who had gone through reggae, started with reggae. They'd all been rare groove DJs. They were funk DJs. They, start, they, they got converted to raving at the end of the 80s. Their black crowd were not into it, right? Their black crowd were conservative. Rare groovers were conservative. I mean, I was a rare groover and I was publicly <laughs> against house music, right? Too simplistic, too mechanical, not soulful enough. But I did sneak off to the, to the rave clubs and found something else going on there. You know, I went to Paul Oakenfold's club Spectrum at Heaven. I went to some other clubs which were doing different like plink street which was this rave which started to it had a kind of sound scruffy sound system aesthetic and it was like a warehouse party but it was hard acid it was it was um it was like avant-garde music it was like a sort of avant-garde art in a way so there was a moment there were lots of different kind of constituencies and various kinds of antagonisms but these guys these forward thinking guys fabio and brian g jumping jack frost who were converted to acid at the end of the 80s became huge DJs on the out of London rave circuit and then a few years later jungle appears you know this is not a coincidence because they brought back to the fore ideas aesthetic ideas which were latent in what they'd always been doing so when I asked Brian G like how come where did jungle come from he pointed to that period of early hardcore where a lot of the music was it was almost infantile in its simplicity it kept um, sampling the soundtrack to children's TV programs or Margaret Thatcher going, oh, have an E. Or, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of playful and childish. And he says, well, the white producers had turned back to what they were doing when they were kids in a way, but that wasn't what we were doing. So for black producers, we turned back to reggae and we turned back to hip hop. It'd been a few years that we hadn't connected those things. So that we brought that back into the dance and it kind of was another upheaval. But again, this is for me, and I think for a lot of the people who went to this stuff, the rare groove period drove a lot of people into looking for secondhand records and rediscovering bands and, you know, the great catalogues of Roy Ayers and um, Donald Byrd and these characters. 
But for me, from then onwards, in Acid and Jungle, I wasn't interested in going to buy the music. Lots of people were and went to the specialist record stores and whatnot. I didn't really care about that. It was just the fact that I felt once you were in the dance, you were there. It wasn't about getting the music, listening to it at home, becoming an expert on that. It was about the experience of being in that place. And the Jungle MC, you know, one of the most common things they say is like, inside the place. It's about honoring and celebrating the moment that you're all in that place together just before the bass really drops and everyone loses their shit. Well, speaking of dropping the bass and, and so on, are there always continuities between musical subgenres and, and particularly in dance? So I'm thinking sort of jungle to drum and bass, dubstep, or rare groove northern soul. Are those kind of connections and continuities always there or does something come along and do, okay, no, we're going to do something completely different now and, you know, stand by, you haven't heard this before. It's a really good question. I think, well, for me, I would say that I think it's all the same thing. I mean, I use the term black music. I think you could equally use the term jazz or you can use the sort of sociological term Afro-diasporic music. There is something continuous. And even in terms of how it evolves and changes and brings brand new things in, which repeat patterns which have been there ever since Congo Square or even before that Congo Square I'm referring to, you know, in New Orleans in the kind of 19th century or even earlier than that, where a drum culture was allowed to emerge amongst slave and post-slave cultures on a Sunday in this place, where rhythmic patterns from West Africa and other parts of Africa were, were remembered in some way, those that had managed to kind of be carried in the bodies of those people who had been so painfully and violently extracted from their homes and combined with new kinds of things. New, so one thing that's always clear is that new technologies offer new options, new possibilities. Jazz is only enabled to happen, jazz as we understand it, because of the excess of musical instruments that were flopping around in that area after the Spanish-American War, the Mexican War of Independence. You know, armies offloaded all of their drums and pipes and snared and uh, cornets to people who picked them up and learned how to use them applied a rhythmic sensibility, which is part of the continuity, really. It's, it's valuing. I mean, I don't want to be in a position to argue that, you know, black music is only rhythmic music, you know, and it doesn't have melody and harmony, which is obviously nonsense. But there's something about the experiment with rhythm and the playing of rhythms off against each other, which is, after all, what drum and bass is, as the way I've described it. But drum and bass doesn't invent drum and bass. Drum and bass was a term that was used to defy describe roots reggae, the essential nature between the drummer and the bass player in a band like the Meters or the James Brown band is what drives it forward. And that goes all the way back. So yes, there are continuities. It's not those continuities. This is the key thing I take from the arguments of the cultural studies scholars like Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy. It's not carried in the blood of black people. It's not biological. It is cultural. And it's a set of traditions and attitudes to culture, to what's valuable, and to technology, which have defined a diasporic way of going about things in the world, which is to say, if you haven't been given access to formal education, to formal museums, universities, law courts, you know, and access to all of that, you have to make do with what you've got. And you are inclined, if you've been suffered from a system whose rules systematically oppress you, not to necessarily follow the rules as they are supposed to be followed. And so you, this is something I took from uh, an interview that Paul Gilroy did with Tony Morrison about the essential nature of diasporic creativity, which is to do with, on the one hand, not looking like you're trying too hard, disavowing technique, and picking things up and doing things with them that were not necessarily anticipated by the people who designed those things or the rules set down. So when Dennis Bavel goes into a studio with producers, trained engineers and producers in the 1970s who are used to producing rock music and he's trying to produce reggae and they say, oh, look at your monitors, everything's up in the red, you better turn it down, it's distorting. And he says, well, no, it's not, listen, it's not distorting, it's just going beyond the level that you've been told is the appropriate level, but I, I'm, that's not right. I have every reason to doubt the kind of truths which are embedded in your system. I mean, this is my interpretation of what he's saying. And I think that's the common thread that runs through all of these things. As new technologies emerge, those new possibilities, and even the limitations. I mean, think of the limited palette of the production in grime, for example. This kind of strange, narrow, cold sound which comes from 
using cracked versions of digital audio software inspired by video games which have been played on crappy little speakers. So something which shouldn't sound right or be thought of as good has been turned into a strong, something highly valued and innovative. And that, that continues to this day. And right now, probably around here, there's some 13-year-old kid sitting in the estate down the road, you know, messing around with something, but applying to it the traditions, the rhythmic traditions. I like to call it kinetic intelligence. I think embedded in the ability to dance or the ability to be a great footballer or the ability to make a great beat is the recognition that rhythm isn't the lowest form of musical communication. <laughs> it may indeed be the, the most important bit of it. And Afro-diasporic music never forgets that, whereas European art music forgot that a long time ago uh, and many forms of rock music and other kinds of commercial pop music either forget it or if they remember it, they remember it because they are inspired by, for example, hip-hop, which is like the blueprint of pop at the moment in the world, isn't it? Is it as cyclical or cyclical as it seems to be? Like, for instance, Broken Beat was a really big thing for me. And it's 20 years and it's coming back in a really big way. There's a new Kaidi Tatum stuff coming out. There's big re retrospectives, Bruck. No, IG culture. Yeah, is, yeah absolutely. So place. And trip-hop, same thing. 20 years, era does again. Is that true of all of these things? Do we just sort of go, what was happening 20 years ago? Let's put that back on the front of the shelves. Well, that's a great question. And I'm sure you've got as, as interesting an answer to this as I have, Andrew. But um, I think there's a slight difference here. And I, as a lover or a, a consumer of an enjoyer of trip hop and dubstep and broken beat, none of those genres, those genres are, have been produced by a kind of cadre of producers really, a sort of group of experimental producers who've got together. And it's really great that they've done that. They've got together and they've kind of worked on new musical ideas and sort of developed a scene. And that scene did have an audience of a kind, but it wasn't that tightly connected to an audience. It didn't have a kind of social being. It had a being which was sort of in the studios, in those kind of circuits of expertise. And therefore, it wasn't protected from the kind of the way in which fashions just move on. I mean, dubstep kind of came and went in London. It really didn't. Now, some of the key figures, Marla and many of these others, I mean, what did Marla do? Having developed dubstep in mass in Brixton, amongst other things, Forward and these other clubs, he went on a journey himself. He went to Cuba and made an album which fused Cuban beats with dubstep. And then, and then he did some other things, done some African stuff as well. Uh, he's kind of put himself on a musical journey of which dubstep arguably was the kind of the beginning rather than the end. And, you know, I don't know any, there's no one who's, as far as I know, sort of passionately engaged with dubstep in, in a way. And at the same time, dubstep had, was part of this really strange, talking about cyclical things, the cyclical way in which Black American music is sold back to white Americans via a process of it coming through Europe. Perhaps you might even call it being laundered through Europe. So it, it stuck, you know, the, we know about the, um, the British invasion bands, what they did with the blues and Muddy Waters and that, and then Acid House, exactly the same thing. And it's then delivered back to the US as EDM by who? Daft Punk, David Guetta, and then who becomes the king of dubstep? Skrillex. So that, and that process is what would leave people, let's call it the underground, although there's a lot of romance tied up with that, you know, saying, oh, well, you can have that, take dubstep, we'll do something else. So th there's no longer a need for it. Broken Beat, slightly different thing. Broken Beat seems to me a kind of, it's a certain, slightly avant-garde take on hip hop, which was always in a tension with the dance floor. Because breaking, I mean, the break beats, yeah, but broken beat is quite tough to dance to. So it requires a certain, you know, and if you don't have a big dance crowd, it's hard to kind of maintain people's attention and interest. And so it goes again, it lives in the studio. It lives in the kind of, in the, in the kind of discussion forums. And it's great that it does, just like Japanese noizu or whatever. Just, you know, some of these genres just live in the minds of the creators and every now and then pop their heads up. So I think that, in that way, those musical ideas will circulate and will come back, of course. In fact, they're there in all of our pop music and a lot of the people who cut their teeth on those kind of scenes, they go on to produce Kylie Minogue and Taylor Swift albums. And I don't even know the names of a lot of these people, but I know that's what they've done. Just like many of the jungle people on the more cinematic side, like Fotec, went to score movies in Hollywood. Like, of course, they were always designed to do. So these, there's a circulation there. In terms of the genres, I know there's this whole debate we perhaps don't want to open up about, or is the genre dead and whatnot. But I do think that to sustain longevity, as drum and bass has done, 
jungle drum and bass is because it's a dance floor genre and they've built this network of global dance floors where that still goes off. Sardinia, Dubai, Australia, an interesting group of sort of expat enclaves, I would say. And there's, there's, you could, there's a political argument you could make there. Whether, you know, it hasn't got a grip or a hold over the, the black audience in London very much. But so what? Because those, that audience is doing something else. And I do think that in terms of the cyclical nature of things, the innovation does still tend to come from unexpected places, people with few options, and people who are prepared to kind of just put energy and effort. The reason why grime happened, you could tell why grime was going to happen, because you saw loads and loads of black school kids running, bar, spitting bars at each other on the bus recording it into their phones. And you were like, well, this is going to lead to something because that never happened in the 80s, which is why UK hip hop in the 80s was pretty rubbish. Uh, but it was ha had happened in America. So when you see people doing that or footwork, these people are practicing their moves because they don't have much else to do. And drill, which is a kind of controversial version of you know grime with kind of supposedly violent and all about drugs and feuds and whatnot. And there is a, there is a story about that. But musically, and it's cutting edge. You know, things are happening there, which are making broken beat and dubstep look like what they are, which is middle age genres. Frankly, <laughs> very which work very well on the internet, and that's fine for them to live there. But whether they come back to life on the dance floor or in actual physical space, it depends whether they can either capture a dance audience for it, or what Grime did was almost open up an, an audience for sort of almost like sort of it's almost like black theater people standing around in in playgrounds and kind of gathering together in groups to swap lyrical flows which keeps it alive and keeps it moving forward so you know i think something like a trip hop i think we can f happily feel that that was a great moment in music that doesn't need to return it did its work it made it pulled together two hitherto separated things basically a hip-hop sensibility with a kind of folky uh, ethereal female vocal vibe loved it i absolutely i mean poor his head you know it's, it's classical music as far as i'm concerned but and gave bristol its moment of course bristol has dub, a drum loads of drum and bass and stuff as well so so we'll see at the moment it's jazz that's running the show but if you go to a jazz show in london you're going to hear broken beat you're going to hear dubstep influences you're going to hear funk you're going to hear ravey references but you're also going to hear saxophone and tuba solos so it's all there it's just put together in a slightly different format but they found an audience they've built a young audience for it and that's what's going to keep it alive in a way that these other genres as the people who love them reach middle age just kind of fade away a little bit and i think we should let them fade away yeah i was going to ask you to what extent are you across the sort of the the most contemporary of uh, music scenes to the extent that you can find parallels but sufficiently is what it sounds like <laughs> well no i don't listen to a lot of pop music i'm you know, I've spent the whole of lockdown talking about those rare groove albums. I've spent the whole of lockdown going back over my record collection and listening to the tracks which I'd overlooked in the past because they weren't the dance floor track and finding so much great music. But I'm also, I mean, one of the great convenient things that's happened is I'm in the middle of London and London, even under lockdown, is having an enormous outpouring of creative music at the moment called jazz. They're calling it the jazz revival or the new jazz or whatever it is. But in fact, what it is, is a, yeah, a new twist on improvised instrument led music, actually, which I've never seen before in London. In the old days, the great musicians were not Londoners. They were people who came through London. They were usually Americans or they were, you know, fellow Cootie's band. They were, there was an Afro jazz thing. British musicians were always lagging behind. Our institutions didn't teach jazz properly or, or making non western art forms of music on your instruments very well but suddenly we've got a generation now being led very excitingly by young female black instrumentalists who are playing trombones trumpets tubers but they're making it in the context of the history of the music which has mattered here so you can hear the hip-hop in it you can hear references to soul jazz jazz funk spiritual jazz the radical jazz of the 60s afrobeat grime um, but done in a in a way, it's not just tasteful, I wouldn't like to use that word because that sounds dismissive, but done with great taste and great respect for these traditions, some of which have been forgotten, some of which 
were reviled like jazz funk. I'm a great jazz advocate for jazz funk. And one of the things I love about it is the way that it was that formal jazz and formal jazz musicians hated it so much and always conceived it as a sellout, an aim to the market. They're just selling out because this is what the market wants. Whereas I conceive it as a reconnection with the dance audience, which I think was a really important thing that they did in the 70s. So a Herbie Hancock, who has had the best-selling jazz album ever and should be rewarded for that because it's absolutely fantastic, Headhunters, he got people dancing to jazz. And he's a key figure in this London jazz scene alongside Fela Kuti, alongside reggae. And because of the changing racial demographics in London, which is that now the London black population is no longer a majority Afro-Caribbean, it's African and West Africa in particular, Nigeria, Ghana, loads of people from Cameroon, lots of French-speaking black African families in London as well people from Somalia, there's been a shift to, and African music and high life and those influences have also come back in to the music at the same time. So it's literally happening all around me at the moment. It's not happening all around me, sadly, but for the past few years in jam sessions, in small places, in quite cheap venues, even in warehouse parties again. So there's a, there's a, a renaissance of the kinds of things that we saw in Rare Groove in terms of young people taking control of their own space and making the music, but suddenly they are technically brilliant musicians. Who can imagine seeing a group of 19-year-olds pogoing to a tuba solo? It's not something I ever thought I'd see in a million years, and then it's right happening right now. Now, that level of player, like Theon Cross, you know, have now gone to next level. You know, he famously did um, South by Southwest this year as a 3D avatar because he wasn't able to go in person, and he's sell selling out venues of like eight, 900 people. Ezra Collective, Nabaya Garcia, they're going to become superstars. But the beauty is they're, they're in their early, early to mid-20s, some a bit older, Shabaka Hunchins, but they've got 20 or 30 years ahead of them to make music. And they're composing, it's all original music, they're composers, they're producers, they're making their own videos. I suspect they own their own masters. The deals they're making with labels are informed by what grime went through in the early 2000s where record companies signed up like 100 grime artists and dropped 99 of them within two years and almost killed grime as a genre. And then grime grew up and realized that they need to control their own destiny and they could use the internet and all those digital tools that you and I talk about. And even if, if you try and raise a note of skepticism, I actually do believe these are democratizing technologies and have put a lot of power into the hands of people who make the music, who want to connect to their audience. So I think we're seeing that happening as well. And academia is a great place to sort of respectively indulge the enthusiasms of your youth. To, to what extent is that you know, why we do this? Oh, I, th I feel like it's, I mean, I, I can't imagine a better scenario for myself. And I want to advocate to other people that academia is a good place to pursue this kind of thing, if you want to. Because, I mean, when I decided to stop being a journalist and do academia, it was because I wanted to spend the majority of my time thinking about the same set of things and learning and researching things which fascinated me. I mean, the reason I wanted to be a music journalist because I wanted to meet and talk to people I admired who did things I was in awe of. And that it remains the case now. And teaching about it as well is exciting because, you know, I'm teaching people who don't know who Margaret Thatcher is. I've got class because I'm my students are a very international crowd. I've got lots of Chinese students, students from Japan, students from Angola. You know, they don't know what punk is. You know, never mind knowing who, you know, Jesse Saunders is or knowing what was happening at the warehouse or knowing the backstory to things that they do like. Because everything they like is, not everything, but most of it is still within this world, which has got a, a fascinating backstory and a fascinating context. So I found that really inspirational. And many of the young people that I, I mean, I learned loads from them because they keep me hip to the music that they want to write about. So, it, and one of the great things about the internet is while I'm marking their essays, I can instantly go to YouTube and pull it up and listen to it. And I'd say the same about Spotify. Every time I hear someone mention something that sounds great, I'm onto Spotify, I've stuck it on a playlist. I can listen to it several times over, get to know it. And if I like it, I'll go to Bandcamp and buy it. You know, and that seems to me actually quite a good way of doing things. <laughs> It's a healthy relationship with uh, with contemporary music. But I'm kind of interested in this because you mentioned a couple of key, maybe even trigger words, 
which are democratizing and emancipatory nature of basically of stuff that I like, which is sort of like the cultural studies sort of default position of like, yeah. yeah, particularly in graduate and postgrad research of I'm now going to write, you know, a 40,000 word dissertation on what's so great about things I like. But is there anything that you can look at this body of work that you've examined and go, well, that's not very good. That's not right. They shouldn't have done this. Or this is something I should be critical about rather than just celebrating the sort of the hands across the water, you know, solidarity of it all. No, it's a really good point. And, you know, it's something to always bear in mind. Of course, we want to be critical thinkers. The danger when you're writing about things, and I say it to my students all the time, you're writing about things you love and you call it unique and you call it earth shattering and you make all kinds of claims for it, which are not substantiated. And that is a danger. I'd say two things. One is when it comes to writing about rare groove, for example, I mean, I was taking the first baby steps. I found one other article that mentioned rare groove in academia. So in some ways, there's a sort of prior step to being critical, which is just to get the information out into the world. Secondly, I think the point is that these things are in motion and there are points at which they can be emancipatory, full of possibility, and other points where they can uh, fail to deliver on that or could be captured by all kinds of other forces. So I have a bit in the book about what happened to Rare Groove. And the point was Rare Groove ran its course. It relied on scarcity and it relied on the fact that the audience were being exposed to something that they actually didn't know anything about. And it was incredibly exciting. And of course, when you actually scratch the surface of what that stuff is, it reveals the wonderful geniuses behind that music as well. But after a few years, it becomes an enclosed system with a certain canon, just like all kinds of things do, becomes boring it becomes predictable, it becomes elitist, it becomes conservative. As Will Straw says this about all music scenes, which I think is a really important thing to remember, they're inherently conservative. I mean, look at Northern Soul. I mean, conservatives are the point where you almost get shot if you play a record which is outside of the defined limits of the canon or had been too commercially successful or has got a synthesizer in it. You know, talk to DJ Bob Jones about this, it's fascinating. So there's inherent conservatism, which I think is important to remember. So it's not just, you know, all happy clappy. There was a key thing I wanted to argue with, and this is why I included Acid House in the book. I mean, I enjoyed raving, sure. Part of it was the drugs, sure. There's only a certain amount of that you can do without losing it, and many people did lose it. But there's lots of it I hated in terms of the music, and also I hated the way it was historicized. I hated because it became such the key moment in club culture for so many people, writers that I admire, people like Simon Reynolds, people like Jeremy Gilbert, even Tim Lawrence up to a point, you know, these are people who've written really great stuff about this, seem to treat Acid House as if it was something unique and something special. Outside of this continuum that I've been talking to you about, this Afro-diasporic continuum. And there was this particular idea which Simon Reynolds came up with, the hardcore continuum, he called it. And he talked about this kind of, this sort of continuity, which was there from the beginning of Acid House all the way through late jungle. And it was what it seemed to me was this was a misrepresentation or a reading of black music which extracted from it those elements of black music which white critics who had been who'd grown up venerating punk and experimental forms of rock music found most familiar or most attractive and they kind of lifted that out and separated from the bits of black music that they really don't like naff jazz funk soul music luther vandross right I mean, to me, Luther Vandross is totally part of the story I've just told. He's connected. To me, Luther Vandross is connected to Acid House and lives within that world as well, even though for some people it's boring, sellout, predictable, you know, sappy, embarrassing, right? It's not Afrofuturistic enough. And I reject that. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to put Acid House in the book and not so much reclaim it for the Afro-diasporic tradition, but to show how it should be situated as a few short years within a much bigger story. And if you want experimentalism, if you want avant-gardism, you can find that in like blues. You can find it in like Marley and Griot music in terms of, you, know, you can find it everywhere you look. It didn't just happen in this one narrow period. And actually rave very quickly. I mean, having gone to, let's say, Cream in Liverpool at some time in the, whenever it was in the mid nineties or home, this dreadful kind of commercial super club in the middle of London and just listening to, fundamentally boring music which was still 
I, this is what the, I guess the point I'm trying to get across is things need to be situated in their time and place. You know, the conjuncture, Stuart Hall's idea of the conjuncture really matters because something which is revolutionary at one period is not revolutionary at another period necessarily. It might only be a couple of years apart. The possibilities it raises are not necessarily going to be fulfilled. In fact, they probably won't be because as we know, when we think about capitalism, it has a great ability to fold back into itself all the critique which is generated on the fringes it's actually part of its logic yeah and the reverse is also kind of true because you can become very very nostalgic about something that you were very sniffy about at the time so you re you know re-narrativize what your experience was absolutely and i think and i still feel the the lure of kind of credentializing and everyone I mean, I feel this for UK jazz at the moment. I'm really worried about UK jazz because of the way in which people can kind of jump on it, lay claim to it. There's talk at the moment about should UK jazz acts ally with brands, right? Because this is a big thing that happens in the, in the music scape, isn't it? And some people are saying, no, that's selling out. And other people are saying, no, no. The problem is that there is no sustainable economy within UK jazz outside of the public funding that's received that's kind of a success story for a certain kind of public funding over the last 10 or 15 years, but it's very vulnerable. How is it going to achieve autonomy? Maybe aligning with Nike or some designer is the way to go. I guess the way I would think about it is that not only are all music scenes born within capitalism, so there is no safe space to stand outside it, but actually this Afro-diasporic tradition we've been describing is one of the best ways to get a sense of what it's like to live within capitalism especially if you live, have lived within capital, racial capitalism as a not white person. So that it's partly produced by the experience of those people who live within capitalism, which because the music industry is capitalism. In fact, it might be capitalism in its most raw and obvious form. So there's no safe space, nor should they be. And we shouldn't be nostalgic. We shouldn't try and, as world music slightly did try and do this, didn't it? Suggest that there was a world of music and production and labels which lived somehow outside in some sort of golden world of like ethnomusicological truth and authenticity. I don't think the music I've been describing is that concerned with those kind of questions. It's more concerned with producing, I mean, let's not be too reticent to use words like love and, and art, you know, access to something profound, something awesome, something different from your everyday experience, something that might provide some possibilities for you in your life. It won't set you free necessarily, but it might provide you, you know, free your mind and your ass will follow. As George Clinton said, you know, there is a relationship between the kinds of things that you can get from the kinds of cultural scenes I'm talking about, I think there is, and generating the possibilities for making, for improving the world or building it differently but it doesn't necessarily deliver those any more than all the talk about the democratization of the internet necessarily delivers a democratic internet because the forces that are trying to enclose it, limit it, conceal it, or just make things so damn convenient that you just use Amazon because you can't be bothered to enter your bank details and every other one's site, betray those possibilities. Casper, thanks so much for your time. It's been really, really interesting. I've got so many things that I want to go further, and I'm kind of I'm aware of the constraints of people's patience for <laughs> my my enthusiasms about things. So we should probably wrap it up there. It's been so fascinating to talk to you. Thanks for your questions, Andy. I know that you and I share a lot, and being asked those pointed questions, the ones you've asked me, are really at the heart of the dilemmas which come with all of this academia over celebration you know nostalgia for something you didn't like in the past all of that so i really appreciate your questioning your kind but sharp questions cheers thanks guys thanks mate that's dr casper malville senior lecturer in global creative and cultural studies at soas and author of it's a london thing how rare groove acid house and jungle remap the city and that's the MTF podcast. I'm going to link to the book in the post and you can find Casper on Twitter at Casper Melville. I'm Dubber at Dubber on Twitter and MTF Labs is at MTF Labs and on the web at mtflabs.net. And of course, while it's always nice to talk about music scenes on the podcast, we don't always talk about music scenes. We talk about AI, business management, urbanism, cybersecurity, wine, astrophysics, intellectual property, nuclear research, creativity, cartography, and Batman. And that's just the last 10 episodes, of which this is number 117. So Feel free to go digging through the back catalogue for more interesting conversations with really brilliant people from the MTF community. Thanks as always to the team, Sergio Castillo, Mars Starton, Jen Kukuchka and Run Dreamer, and to 2050 and Airtone for the music. Thanks to you for listening, have a great week, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>
Cheers. 